The following program is a presentation of the Civil War Broadcasting Network, available on the free YouTube channel, General Grant by himself, or Dr. E.C. Fields. On the Facebook page, Kurt Fields as General Ulysses S. Grant, and on various other social media. The website is generalgrantbyhimself.com. This program is one of those presentations in the ongoing series, General Grant Looks at the American Civil War, wherein General Grant looks at a person, place, or event in the Civil War for reflection and observation. Permission to copy and distribute is given and indeed encouraged. Remember, you are the future of our past. And now, General Grant. <clears throat> I am General of the Army Ulysses S. Grant and welcome to my parlor here by the fireplace where tonight I should like to reflect with you upon the April the 8th, the next to the last day essentially of the war when General Lee surrendered to me on April 9th. Uh, but I must needs give a brief chronology of the days leading up to that to give a full frame of reference to what happened beginning on April the 7th at 5 p.m. when I sent General Lee the first message entreating him to surrender. <clears throat> on April the 1st, uh, we had about 125,000 federal soldiers. Lee had about 50,000, but of that 50,000, only about 35,000 or so were effective for combat. And uh, we had 35 miles of trenches. Now, I had ordered an all-out assault at 4 a.m. on April the 2nd, uh, but that became unnecessary, as I'll explain in just a moment. On April the 1st, George Pickett uh, was badly defeated at Five Forks a vital intersection for Lee. It was the most lopsided Union victory of the war. Sheridan lost some six, 700 casualties and uh, Pickett, George Pickett, lost 5,000 killed, wounded, and captured. It was a devastating blow to Lee, both in irreplaceable manpower and in the uh, functions of his army moving and uh, his mobility. On April the 2nd, he felt that uh, with us closing in on the final railroad going into Petersburg, that Petersburg was no longer tenable. He advised President Davis, who was at church at the time, that he was going to evacuate Petersburg and Richmond would likely fall. Uh, <clears throat> and he began his evacuation. Uh, so at that point, the, uh, there was no one to assault on the morning of April 2nd. And on, Lee began his escape and I sent our forces after him. At about nine o'clock in the morning on April 3rd, I rode into Petersburg and it was virtually abandoned. Everybody was in pursuit of Lee. But I also met with President Lincoln uh, at the house of a, an attorney who was not there Thomas Wallace. In fact, I think a former or a friend, a uh, current friend of the president. Uh, the president at that meeting told me memorably for me, before I left him, he said, General, when you catch Lee, let him up easy. When you do the surrender terms, let him up easy. And I told him I can do that, Mr. President. Also significant for me, it was the last time I ever saw President Lincoln. And then I left in pursuit of Lee. On April the 4th, Lee had gotten to Amelia Courthouse. He tried to get, uh, or he got to a train that uh, hopefully by now he's got 30,000 troops and uh, get food for them, they were starving. And the train was loaded with ammunition. Lee had a day's start on me, eight to ten hours start on me. But I applaud him because Lee, the soldier, became Lee the humanitarian. 
he stopped, he relinquished that lead, that military advantage, to forage in the, the area to try to get his soldiers some food. He was unsuccessful. Nobody in that area of Virginia, Central Virginia, had any food at that time. And uh, he had tried valiantly, but he didn't feed his troops and they gave up the lead. Now I'm right behind him with that 125,000 troops on the Potomac, the Army of James, and we, we Sheridan with the cavalry, we are in hot pursuit. Uh, and on the 5th of April, as we're moving, I, in the, uh, in the late afternoon, was approached by a Confederate soldier before he was brought through the lines. He was a spy being sent from Sheridan. And uh, I'd been traveling up until then with Meade, the Army of Potomac, and uh, with Ord and, and Gibbon, Sixth Corps, General Gibbon. But J.A. Campbell pulled a tinfoil pouch out of his mouth with a tissue paper message from Sheridan that said, I really wish you were here with me. That's all it took for me because I knew Sheridan would be uh, on the cutting edge of this effort to get to Lee. And I uh, immediately left to go meet him <clears throat> some several miles. And I had been riding Jeff Davis, good old, good old rock and horse ride. But I switched to Cincinnati, my 18 hand stallion charger because I thought I just may need a more powerful horse for what's about to happen. And uh, with a, a staff of escort of 14, we pressed on to meet with Sheridan, got to his headquarters, it was a moonlit night. We took the chance of traveling at night and uh, met with him. We initially thought Lee was going to Danville along the railroad to cut south just a few miles into uh, North Carolina and join Joe Johnston, who's only 100 miles away. But with Lee's difficulties getting food <clears throat> and losing the lead, he was going further west to sweep down into uh, North Carolina. The orders that were in force at that time would have allowed him to escape. So Sheridan and I went to see Meade, who was now a bed, sick, had some really serious stomach problems. In fact, he's riding in an ambulance wagon. And uh, talked with him being the commander of the army, and uh, persuaded him to change his orders, which he did, and then Sheridan was cut loose to go after Lee once again in pursuit. And on April the 6th, the next day, he caught Lee at Sailor's Creek, which was, I dare say, the greatest debacle disaster of Lee's experience. Uh, there uh, were nine Confederate generals captured and they were, as a matter of fact, Seth Barton, Meriwether Lewis Clark, Montgomery D. Corse, Dudley DuBose, Richard S. Ewell, Effa Hunton, Joseph Kershaw, James Sims, and Custis Lee, General Lee's son. So nine generals were captured that day. And Lee lost 7,700 men, killed, wounded, most of them captured. It was the, uh, the time, I understand, sitting his horse on a promontory overlooking a battle, he, he said loudly, my God is the, the army, my army dissolving. And essentially it was. He was reeling. Now he's down, he lost 25% of his army at Sailor's Creek of what he had left. So now he's getting down close to about 30,000 or less. And on that day, at, I was at Burksville Junction, and a Dr. Smith was brought to me. Now, Dr. Smith is a cousin of Dick Ewell, one of those men captured that day, and he talked with his cousin. And Ewell had told him, as Dr. Smith was relating to me, when we knew it was over when you fellas crossed the James. And... Uh, we should have bargained for uh, conditions uh, when we had something to bargain with. Now we don't. And any man who dies now is uh, really nothing less than murder. Uh, and I took this to heart from Dr. Smith. He said Ewell was 
was emphatic in what he was saying. And I got a note from Sheridan that said, I believe Lee will surrender if the thing is pressed. I forwarded that to President Lincoln. He immediately telegraphed back, then let the thing be pressed. And the hunt's closing in. On April the 7th, I got in there into that town of Farmville in about mid-morning, late morning, and our advance guard was right behind Lee's uh, rear guard. And I went to the Prince Albert Hotel and set up my headquarters. It was devoid of furniture. It had, in fact, uh, used as a hospital. And uh, I was sitting on the front porch, and a, a ragged Confederate colonel was brought to me, tall, spare man, and he was introduced to me as Colonel Richard Booker. And my aides told me that he had requested that he surrender to me personally. They brought him to me. And I uh, was there with General Ord, General Gibbon, Sixth Corps, Ord with the Army of the James. And uh, Colonel Booker told me that uh, that was, in fact, his hotel. His family had owned it. He had raised a regiment there when the war started and uh, had been wounded a year or so before, gone into the Reserve Corps, he was back in active duty. And as they were in retreat coming through Farmville with Lee's army, he said that he looked around and realized that he was the last man still in the regiment in the army. And he said, General, I was home. And I decided I'm staying home. And I walked into this hotel, and it is my home, and I'm staying here. And I surrender to you. I told him I appreciated his sentiments and said, uh, as long as you stay here and do not take up arms against the United States of America, you will not be disturbed in your person or your property. And then I left uh, definitive orders that he was not to be harassed, nor any of his property. And uh, I mused aloud to Ward and Gibbon and said, you know, I think I'll, I think it's time that I sent General Lee a letter and asked him to surrender. It may be time. So th at five o'clock on April the 7th, I sent this note to General Lee. General, the result of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. I feel that it is so, and regard it as my duty to shift from me the responsibility of any further effusion of blood by asking you the surrender of that portion of the CS Army known as the Army of Northern Virginia. Very respectfully, your obedient service, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General, commanding United States Armies. I understand that General Lee got that note at about 10 o'clock, and I also understand that after he read it, he silently passed it to Pete Longstreet, his old war horse, and one of my very best friends. And uh, Longstreet read it and said but two words, not yet. So General Lee wrote this reply to me immediately. 7 April 65, General, I have read your note of this date. Though not entertaining the opinion you express of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia, I reciprocate your desire to avoid the useless effusion of blood. And therefore, before considering your proposition, ask the terms you will offer on condition of its surrender. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, R.E. Lee. Well, I got that late, way one or two o'clock in the morning, and I had already gone to bed to get some badly needed sleep because I had left on the 2nd of April. This is now the evening of the uh, 7th. This is five days later. And I have not bathed 
or even changed my clothes in that time because we were moving so fast. And one of the driving reasons for me sending that note to General Lee was I had seen something that I've never seen before in an army. Uh, there were no stragglers. No man wanted to be the last man killed, but every man knew that we had Lee on the run and no one wanted to miss the end. Everybody wanted to be there when it was finally over. So there was nobody on the side of the road, nobody eating fruit off of trees, nobody napping. Everybody was in the ranks. In fact, we were moving almost at a trot to catch Lee. But the morning of the 8th, I sent this uh, to General Lee. At your note of last evening, in reply to mine of same date, asking the condition on which I will accept the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia is just received. In reply, I would say that, peace being my great desire, there is but one condition I would assist upon, viz. that the men and officers surrendered shall be disqualified for taking up arms against the government of the United States until properly exchanged. I will meet you or will designate officers to meet any officers you may name for the same purpose of arranging the terms upon which the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia will be received. Very respectfully, U.S. Grant. Now note, I said, I extended an olive branch I said, I will meet you or will designate officers to meet officers you designate uh, to arrange the surrender. I was being very diplomatic and kind. And I sent that back to him. Now, he got it late in the day on April the 8th. He's on the move. Now, remember, he's still trying to escape. He's still trying to get food for his troops. He's probing, he's constantly moving, and has not by any means given up the fight. And there was plenty of fight left in that rapidly dwindling army that he had because they were losing men by the hour in desertions. And just as uh, Colonel Roberts, uh, Colonel Booker rather, had said to me, I went home. I was at home and I went home. So General Lee replied to me, I received at a late hour your note of today. In mine of yesterday, I did not intend to propose the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, but to ask the terms of your proposition. And to be frank, I do not think the emergency has risen to call for the surrender of this army. But as the restoration of peace should be the sole object of all. I desired to know whether your proposals would lead to that, and I cannot therefore meet you with a view to surrender the Army of Northern Virginia. But as far as your proposal may affect the CS forces under my command and tend to the restoration of peace, I shall be pleased to meet you at 10 a.m. tomorrow on the old stage road to Richmond between the picket lines of the two armies. Very respectfully, Robert E. Lee. This frustrated me because if, if you don't think I was calling for the surrender of the army, or, or if you're not talking about the surrender of the army of Northern Virginia, who do you think I'm asking to surrender? And you don't want to surrender the army of Northern Virginia, but you're talking about surrendering the forces under your command. They don't call him the Silver Fox for nothing. And uh, this, I was outdone with this reply. And again, this is uh, getting into late on April the 8th. And I, by this time, I had moved into Kurdsville, Virginia, at a farmhouse. And I, I got this late uh, on the the uh, eighth into the ninth. At that time, I had a pounding headache, a, a migraine headache, and uh, was deathly sick, and I w was trying to deal with this information, and I decided to wait until the morning. And early in the morning, I got up, had coffee, uh, 
and called for Cincinnati at about four o'clock in the morning, thinking the cold, the cool air was about 30 degrees, uh, foggy, would clear my head, it didn't. And uh, I had some coffee and wrote this reply to General Lee. General, your note of yesterday is received. As I have no authority to treat on the subject of peace, the meeting proposed for 10 a.m. today could lead to no good. I will state, however, General, that I am equally anxious for peace with yourself and the whole North to entertain the same feeling. The terms upon which peace can be had are well understood. By the South laying down their arms, they will hasten that most desirable event, save thousands of human lives and hundreds of millions of property not yet destroyed. Sincerely hoping that all our difficulties may be settled without the loss of another life, I subscribe myself very respectfully, your obedient servant. And I sent that to him and got on Cincinnati. And not expecting to meet him so soon, I was wearing uh, no spurs, my sack coat, my hat with no hat cords, no sword. It's the way that I travel daily, my, my attire with the Army. And we began to move. Now, General Lee had ordered on the morning of the 9th that General Gordon try to break out, uh, make one last punch to get through to Johnston. It was unsuccessful. Ord and Given had 30,000 troops blocking his way, and uh, Gordon sent back to General Lee that unless General Longstreet who can come and help me, I have done all I can. My troops have fought to a frazzle. And it was then that Lee realized it was over. So between 8.30 and 9 a.m. on the morning of April 9th, he sent me this letter. General, I received your note this morning on the picket line whether I had come to meet you and ascertain definitely what terms were embraced in your proposal of yesterday with reference to the surrender of this army. I now request an interview in accordance with the offer contained in your letter of yesterday for that purpose. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, Ari Lee. So at last, Lee has said, I want to meet to discuss the surrender. And uh, he sent another note <clears throat> through the lines asking for a suspension of hostilities because Meade had said, I can't, I'm ordered to attack this morning. I can't stop that. I don't have the authority to stop that. But send another note to uh, Grant through my lines. And then he said, send another note about an hour later through Sheridan's lines and uh, asked to meet Grant. And he did. So I had moved from the Lynchburg-Richmond Road to the Lynchburg-Farmville Road because we'd run into Confederate forces. The Army didn't know specifically where I was. So I've got three armies looking for me, Meade and the Army of the Potomac, Ord's Army and the Army of the James, uh, Sheridan with the cavalry, and Lee sending people through our lines with escorts, and they're having a difficult time locating me. And uh, finally, at about 11.50 a.m., Major Charles Pease came thundering up to my party, again an escort of about 14 or 15 men, shouting and yelling, he'd forgotten himself, and handed me a note. And I handed it to John Rawlins, who read it and gave it to me. And it said, and I asked him to read it to the troops. He, he started to read it and he, he began to cry. And he gave it to me and I read it. And this was the, uh, the note that Lee had sent me wanting to surrender. That was the note, and it broke Rawlins down. So I got off my horse, and I wrote this letter to uh, Lee, and said, General Ari Lee, commanding CS Army, your note of this date is but of this moment, 11.50 a.m., received in consequence of my having passed from the Richmond and Lynchburg Road to the Farmville and Lynchburg Road, and I am at this riding about four miles west of Walker's Church, 
and will push forward to the front for the purpose of meeting you. Notice that on this road, where you wish the interview to take place will meet me. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, U.S. Grant. Now, I wrote the specific time, 11.50 a.m., because I knew, I saw by the letter, that they'd been looking for me for a couple of hours. I told him specifically where I was, four miles west of Walker's Church, which is 12 miles east of Appomattox Courthouse, meaning I had eight miles to go. And I, in that muddy Virginia countryside, it had been raining off and on all week. I knew it would take some time. I also said, I will meet you where you wish the interview to take place. So it was a final gesture on my part to be conciliatory. And at that moment, I got on my horse again and we began to ride as fast as we could to Appomattox Courthouse to meet General Sheridan and then go to meet General Lee and discuss and take the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. That is the sequence of events of the last six days, particularly the last two days, day and a half, April 7th into evening, April 7th into the morning of April 9th. And I uh, should stop my reflection there. Our next reflection, I'm going to uh, think about and talk with you about actually meeting General Lee, what we said, what I said in the surrender conditions, and what I did not say in the surrender conditions, which are as important as what I did say. General Lee's brief acceptance and our departure. So for the moment, I uh, beg your indulgence to bid you farewell and hope that you will join me next time here in the parlor where I will reflect about meeting General Lee and the surrender. I thank you and look forward to our coming together again in the parlor.